Well, hello, we are back again, and today I have the privilege of speaking with Dr. Justin Alexander, a professor of music at VCU. Hello, how are you today? I'm doing well, thank you very much for having me. Of course, thank you for coming out. And just to start us out, I'd love for you to just talk a little bit about how did you get into music? Like starting from youth or wherever you want to start from, how did you get to becoming the music professor you are today? Sure. Um, so my uh, start in music happened very early when I was maybe three or four. Um, I became interested in drums. I think I had seen some drums at some point on TV or in a catalog or something like that. And I, um, my parents got me a little play drum set and I played around with that for a little bit. And as I got a little bit older, I started setting up pots and pans and glasses and hitting those things. And when I was about seven, uh, I found out that my neighbor down the street, uh, a friend that I played with, his dad had a real drum set in their garage. So I wandered over there one day and my friend took me into the garage and we sat down and I saw the drum set and I started doing the stuff that I was doing on pots and pans and just making, making noise. And his dad came out and showed me how to play a real simple rock beat. And that was kind of it for me. At that point I was really hooked. I loved the way it sounded, I loved the way it felt to play it. Um, and I begged my parents to get me into lessons and to get me a drum set. They didn't start with a drum set, they got me a practice pad and a pair of sticks uh, when I was seven. I started taking lessons with a guy at a local music store and just kept at it until I was about uh, nine or ten. I got my first drum set, uh, 11, 12, whenever beginning band started. I joined band, percussion, not really fully understanding what that meant, but knowing that it was drums in some way. And so I was playing percussion in band, and I started playing keyboards and bass drum and cymbals and all the things that you play as a percussionist. And at that point, I, I just kept going. Um, you know, when you're in school and you're good at something, like you wanna keep doing it. Um, I got into some local bands and toured and recorded. And when it, time, it got time to go into college, there was just nothing else that I knew I wanted to do. I didn't know that I wanted to be a professor, I just knew I wanted to do music. So I went to the University of Central Arkansas and I started studying percussion there, not really understanding, not, I understood what I was doing, but not really knowing where it was gonna go. I thought about, do I wanna be a high school band director or do I want to like try to tour, do I wanna do a cruise ship or musicals or whatever. And around my junior, between my junior and senior year, um, as I was, starting to figure out what was going to happen next after I graduated. I really decided that what I wanted to try to do was to teach uh, at a university. So that meant going to graduate school and then getting a doctorate and then applying for jobs. And so um, really like after I got into beginning band, I just never looked back. Like that was what I was doing. Okay, so you've been a percussion your entire life. Yeah. There was yeah, yeah. never any question of what type of music you wanted to play. No, 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 no. Okay, very nice. Well, I actually started with tuba and then moved on to specifically mallet percussion in high school. Okay. And I am far better at mallets than I am <laughs> at drumming. Yeah. Do you find any specific like instrument within percussion playing more difficult for you? Or is it at this point everything feels easy? Uh, not, not everything feels easy, certainly, and percussion is such a broad category of instruments that um, you can have wildly different techniques between two instruments that are both percussion instruments. Um, I would say like drum set and multi-percussion, snare drum, those are the things that have come easiest to me, those are the things I've been doing the longest and where I started and where I feel at home. Um, I worked really hard to get my keyboard percussion chops up um, and I do a lot of that now but I would say that that's probably the area that I am least comfortable um, although I do it at a, at, a, at a decent level and I have to do it a lot so I'm comfortable with it but comparatively to drum set it doesn't feel quite as home Right, it's it it's less natural with yeah. the mallets and the yarn yeah, yeah. and all that. Okay. And I started later in that. I didn't really start keyboard, like serious keyboard percussion until probably 10th or 11th grade. And that, by that point, I was, I'd already been playing drum set for 
years that was, five or six years. So there was a gap there. I had to sort of kind of become a beginner again on that stuff and try to catch up to where I was on, on drums. And did you ever play piano or anything else? Or was it just mallets were your first experience with yeah, keyboard that instrument? that was the first one. So I didn't play piano until I was in college and had to take piano courses. Um, now, I think that playing keyboard percussions is laid out like a piano, like helped me just visualize what I was doing on the piano, but I had no like finger dexterity really. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. It's easy when it's all laid out to see the notes, but a yeah. lot harder to know how to play them. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I have to ask, do you have a favorite piece and or a favorite performance you've ever done? Oh, wow. Oh, gosh, a favorite piece. Percussion specific? Or ah, the floor is yours. You can take it wherever you want. Okay. Uh, my favorite piece of music. I think if I had to pick like one piece that I would take with me to a desert island, that was all I had to listen to would be Mahler 2, Mahler 2nd Symphony. It's not particularly like percussion heavy. I mean, there's a number of typical percussion stuff, but like just the overall. Uh, impact of that piece, uh, I think, can be overstated on me. Um, a favorite performance? Probably say, um, well, two things. The first one would be I did a series when I was in graduate school. I had a percussion quintet that toured uh, Costa Rica. So there was a program we had at school that would take uh, graduate chamber groups and would take them to some country in uh, Central South America and you would do a tour and we got Costa Rica. And we had about a week of like seven performances and they were all, were all sold out, they were all like really positive. Um, that whole week of performances stands out to me as like one that was really remarkable. Uh, the other one, I would say more recently, um, last year I played in the pit for the touring show of Wicked. So I played all the percussion book. There was a drum drummer that was touring there, but I played the percussion book. And I would say it's very rare, I think, in like in my field, like what I do as a classical musician, to uh, play to like sold out shows for like two weeks straight and have people really go crazy about what you're doing. But that was the experience because people love Wicked, and it was a lot of fun to to be in a to be playing that music and to be playing for an audience that was so excited about it. Okay, and was Wicked here in Richmond or somewhere else? No, it was here in Richmond. I I love Wicked. I must have missed it. I know I saw Hamilton last year. So oh, I'm, okay, it was yeah. like early. It was like late August, early September of last year. I don't even have the excuse. I wasn't on campus then. <laughs> have you done other musicals or just Wicked? Oh yeah, no, I've done a bunch. Um, I've done uh, Mean Girls. Um, I'm doing Tina when that comes through in April. I've done Cinderella and a bunch of classic ones with Virginia Repertory Theater. And that's some of my favorite playing to do, honestly. Yeah, how is learning the music for that different than learning the music for, say, a classical piece? Or is it different? It's different in that, like with a Classic, if I play with the symphony, for instance, I sub in with the Richmond Symphony sometimes. If I sub in with them, unless we're playing like Harry Potter, uh, if we're playing you know, Mahler or Dvorak or Shostakovich or something fairly standard, I usually play one instrument and assign cymbals or bass drum or triangle or whatever, and that's what I play. Uh, when I played Wicked, there were, I think the final count was like 67 different instruments in that setup. So there's an element of like just logistics that you have to think about that you don't have to think about with a lot of other playing. Like how am I going to physically get to all these instruments? And what you end up doing is setting up things in a circle. So you just spin around and play when you need to. Um, so there's the element of that. And then from one musical to the next musical, your setup, you could use the same instruments, but your setup may be different depending on what you need. So it's almost like every time you do one of those shows, you have to learn a new multi-instrument. So it doesn't always mean that when I see vibraphone, it's gonna be here. You know, it may be here for this piece because it may be more important and I need to see the conductor or bass drum may be over here or bass drum may be over here for another piece. So you really have to learn like the choreography of a piece 
it's different every time. Okay, and you learn the choreography. I assume you would never change like where things are on your drum set though, right? No, not really. I mean, I did when I was younger, just experiment, but at this point, like I feel like I know what I'm, right. what I you, want things. You figured it out. Yeah. And when you play drum set, are you mostly playing jazz music at this point or something else? Uh, yeah, I play a lot of jazz, but um, I play um, whatever, I mean, the mo most of the time when I'm playing drum set, it's either jazz oriented, it's a pops show with the symphony. So that could mean a bunch of things. That could mean like music from the 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, or uh, I'm playing for a musical, which could also mean a lot of things. Um, it could be like classic, like Rodgers and Hammerstein, like two beat kind of, boom chick, boom chick, boom chick. It could be rent, it could be rock and roll, it could be lots of things. So uh, I kind of play it all. I wouldn't say that I'm the greatest jazz drummer, but I think I'm pretty good at covering all of it oh. and, and sounding yeah, You good. cover all the bases, you yeah. play what they need you to play. Yeah. Okay, very nice. I wanna come back to drum set in a second, but I know that when I was reading online a bit about you just so I didn't come in woefully under underprepared, uh -huh. I read you were doing some Hindustani classical music. How'd you get into that? So uh, that was about six years ago when I started that, and I was coming up um, how did I get started in that? I'd always been interested in it. And I think that one thing that I really believe in like my teaching is that I, I think it's important to not stop learning. And I think it's important to like put yourself as a teacher to put yourself back in a position where you're learning so you can remember what it feels like to be a student. When I'm working with students at, at VCU, who are playing drum set or snare drum or marimba or something that I've been playing for a long time, it's easy to forget how difficult it is when you're just starting out or you know even at intermediate level, if you're pushing them with a new piece of music, it's easy to forget how hard it is. So I have that basic philosophy that I think it's important to keep learning and to put yourself in that situation. But I'd always been interested in, in tabla and Hindustani music, and but never really had a outlet to explore it or someone to take lessons with and I was also getting a little stale in my teaching and just wanted to look at something new and try something different and so I reached out to a guy that I knew through mutual friends named Sean Medovetsky who is a Canadian percussionist but he pretty much has only done tabla for the past 30 years um, studied in India um, with a really 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 famous uh, tabla player and I reached out to him and we started doing online lessons and then I would go to uh, to Montreal and meet with him and do, do in-person stuff. He has a summer week-long intensive that he does that I've done a couple times. So I just started taking lessons and just learning the basics of playing tabla and compositions and how things are structured. And then that opened up a whole new avenue of uh, how we think about music and how we think about composing and how we think about rhythm and how it works that's been really interesting and fruitful for me for my teaching back at VCU. Yeah, what new avenues has it opened up? Actually, that leads wonderfully into a question I had. Yeah, so first of all, like when you learn tabla, so I'll use that as an example since that's what we're talking about, but uh, it's completely uh, an oral tradition. So there's nothing written down. You learn, your teacher says something. So all of the sounds on the drums have vocal syllables that go with them. Okay. So if I, if I said uh, da da te te da da te na, I would know what that what strokes that is on the drum. Okay. So my teacher would recite uh, something to me and then I would play it. And you repeat it a lot. And it's really amazing like how the, uh, the sort of the vocalization of something, putting it with the hands, and repeating it like cements it in your mind. Like I can recall like all of my compositions and never having seen them written down. So there's that aspect of learning um, orally or orally, you know, oral transmission, learning how it sounds just by ear and not really worried about what something looks like on a page, which I think is vitally important for anybody in music today. Like I think reading is great. I think being able to play by ear is also equally important. Um, and then like the rhythmic sort of ideas in tabla playing, um, things like tihais, for instance, which are rhythmic repetitions that, um, that 
may not be necessarily in the meter that you're in, but that resolve on beat one of uh, a beat or a bar okay. or a cycle. Um, this sort of building block, this like they sort of have a modular approach to rhythm, and um, it was just a way I'd never thought about rhythm before. And my teacher Sean actually wrote, ended up writing um, a snare drum book based on tabla compositions. So it doesn't sound like it sounds like snare drum. It doesn't sound like tabla, but all of the rhythmic elements and like the compositional elements of tabla playing are in that snare drum book, and I use it extensively with my students. Mm. I would also say the other thing is just like composition-wise, like learning what a composition is on tabla and thinking of the drums as, not for me necessarily, but for some of my students, honestly, like thinking of the, of the drums as melodic and musical and able to hold a composition by themselves, I think is an important thing for percussionists especially that think is valid. Yeah, there aren't many pieces where the drummer is the star of the show and yeah. making their own melody. Right, right, right. Okay. Yeah, you had mentioned those modular elements. Is it at all similar to polyrhythms and anything related to like that? Or is it completely different? Yeah, no, no. I mean, it's similar. On Tabla, you're not really playing like polyrhythms like two against three or four against three or something like that. Um, it's more of... It's a good way to explain it. So if you took very classic rhythm uh, that's found all over the world, right? Let's just double that. Okay. Six six four. Okay. Um, if you call the if you call the six A, the other six A and the four B, you can put those three different ways, right? Yeah. And it's going to work out. Right. Right. If you divide that in half, so you've got three three two three three two A B A A B, uh, you can put, do that. 15 different ways, I think, and it's always going to work out. Okay. If you factorial it. I was going to say, I'll trust your math on that. Yeah, I think it's 15. Um, so you'll find out really quickly, like, okay, a few of these elements, like a few of these combinations, like, feel natural to me. Like, I just know how they feel. Like, if we did 664 six, again, if I did 646, six, that feels very natural to me. Okay. Um, but you'll find in those like 15 combinations, there's probably like seven or six of them that unless you know that there's 15 that you're trying to find, like they don't feel, it's not something you would naturally think of as a player. And everyone's different that way. Like there'll be rhythms that feel more natural to you than feel to me. And so like knowing like, okay, I've got three, three, two, three, 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 two, three, three, two. I've got 15 different combinations that I can make of those things about seven of them come naturally. So I've got about eight I need to like find. Once I find one that doesn't feel natural to me, like I've got new vocabulary. And then I can use that when I'm improvising, when I'm composing, uh, if it comes up in a piece, like it becomes more naturally feeling to me, I'm used to it because it's, I've gone through this process. So that modular approach to rhythm like really yields new, I would say like new rhythmic combinations that wouldn't necessarily happen organically if you weren't searching for them. Interesting. So it's the different permutations of how you put these beats together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That that's cool. And now I'm very interested in this. Yeah. But, no. It's very. Okay. It's fascinating. Yeah. To kind of go down a bit of a different path. Obviously, when you're a percussionist and you're a drummer, you're kind of the base for tempo within most ensembles. Like with a, when you're playing drum set in an ensemble, you're pretty much expected to hold the tempo. Sure. When you're playing jazz versus a musical versus something else, does your feeling of how you feel timing and tempo change? And if I need to elaborate more on that, I can. Um, so if I'm playing a musical, 95% of the time there's a click track. Everyone's on a click. Everyone's got headphones on, everyone's on a click. Okay. Uh, we have a music director that's talking to us through a mic. That's so. I feel like my responsibility there is certainly like staying with the click, like everyone's is, but more, can I make the style, can I set the style within the, the click? Okay. So if we're playing a jazz waltz or a two beat or a samba or something, I've got something giving me 
the time in my ear, but I still have to make it feel good, feel okay. organic. Uh, if I'm playing like with a jazz quintet or something, certainly um, I'm not going to rush or drag by like 20 beats or so, but there is natural like, okay, we're, it's something's happening and it moves up five beats or comes back down or, I mean, there is a little bit of swimming in time. No one, no one has perfect time. Um, so in addition to like setting the style, like I'm, I'm thinking about maintaining the baseline tempo, but also like not so, uh, not so obsessed with it that the music can't move or breathe. Okay. And you find that in classical music all the time, like stuff slows down and speeds up and like it's written into the, the part. And we're not gonna go from like 120 beats to 80 beats a minute, unless that's part of the composition. But if we go from 120 to 126 to 118, like that, that's okay. Right. I. I guess part of it, I never realized for musicals they have click tracks. I guess that yeah. makes oh, yeah, yeah. a bunch of sense. But yeah, yeah. Okay. Especially because, like, you know, if you work with dancers a lot, if you if you mess with the tempo, they can't dance to it. I mean, it's got to be the same every night or else um, they can't do the moves. Okay. Uh, it makes a big difference. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's interesting hearing you talk about kind of how the tempo fluctuates in jazz based on what's going on. I had a band director in high school who was so insistent we gotta play with the Met because we struggled to hold together. Yeah. And yeah. then when we finally got it, it was like, okay, now we can open up. So yeah. it's interesting hearing like how tempo can be different and how strict you need to be changes with how good at music you are. Sure, sure. Yeah. And I find that like there's a range of tempos, generally speaking, that feel a certain way. And like some people say it's like rel related or close to like the your heartbeat rhythm, so somewhere between like 60 and if you're exercising, you know, 140 or so, like those tempos tend to feel good for us. So like if you if you told me to play a bossa nova, I, I sort of have in my head, even though I don't know the number, like a tempo that that feels good based on listening and playing a lot. And so if someone comes to me and gives me a tempo like this and says, play a bossa nova, well, I know that that's not right. It doesn't. It's not going to sound right. So, there is an important aspect of playing with the metronome and like learning how to have a good time, how to have good time, and have a good time. But uh, there is an element like once you once you have a, a sense of like good natural time of letting the music breathe a little bit, like it's okay for it to move. Yeah. I think. That makes sense, but then I guess I have to ask, how do you teach those things that you can't necessarily say, here's exactly when it can change? Mm -hmm. How do you explain those things that are feel-based rather than musically notated? So, um, this sounds basic, but I find that I have to say it a lot, is that you have to listen to music. Um, I have students all the time that say that they want to be great at X, whatever that is, and I ask them what they're listening to, and it's not X. And I support having broad, very, very broad, wide-ranging um, tastes in listening and, and consuming art and all that kind of stuff. But if you want to be a great jazz drummer, like you have to listen to great jazz drummers. And the more you spend dedicated time listening to those recordings and those drummers, like you'll hear like tempos moving. Like, and so you'll know, like, and it's not like someone thinking like, well, I'm just gonna push it here a little bit because we're getting to the bridge. They may be thinking that, I don't know. If the soloist is like really hot and like just getting more and more energy, it's just gonna pick up a little bit. And it's okay to go with that. You can't be like, well, I'm gonna hold it back at 120, even though this person who's soloing like wants to push it. So you have to listen. You have to like have references like historically, like what's happened before, like how things feel, what the style is, all that stuff, you know, it's like, it's like Brazilian 16th notes have this swing to them that you can't really notate unless you wanted to like notate partials of quintuplets and, you know. So how do you learn it? You just have to listen to it until it becomes part of your vocabulary. Okay. 
Yeah, that makes sense. And I think I have one more question for you, and then I'll let you get on with the rest of your day. <laughs> you mentioned wanting to be a student and continuing to learn. Is there anything in the future, either with learning music for yourself or teaching or any projects in the future that you are looking forward to doing slash learning slash whatever else? Yeah, so I think, you know, in the past, like maybe starting with the tabla, and then I did some sell some Carnatic Indian music too, um, playing Redungum for a little bit. Um, in the past like six years, five years or so, I've gotten super interested in just exploring more and more world, more, sort of more and more music outside of the U.S. and outside of like the Western um, experience. And that ranges from uh, Brazilian music, uh, West African music, um, gamelan with the, with the Andy does. Um, so there's a couple of things I'm excited about. I'm working on a project right now to like, study abroad for my students to go to Puerto Rico actually and learn about bomba, and plana music, and the sort of instruments and the rhythms that go with that. Um, and then I'm, I've sort of recommitted a, a deep dive into back into tabla, which I've taken a break for the past maybe year and a half or so. Um, that I'm going to start up in January again. So I'm going to jump back into that and see how, how much deeper I can go into that and see how that affects everything else that I do. So I'm getting into uh, more improvisation right now, I'm getting into composition, and before I sort of start churning out pieces or start really sitting down to work on a piece, I want to absorb a little bit more um, musical influence from these, uh, these genres and styles and cultures and all that. And I think the best way to do that is just to sort of, it's like, like learning a language, it's like immersion. So I'm gonna to try to immerse myself in these other sort of uh, musical cultures as best I can while still living here and see what sort of comes out, what becomes like part of my sort of natural vocabulary and what I can use when I'm being creative. Okay, so in the future, I look forward to hearing new pieces from you inspired by music all around the world. Great. And once again, thank you so much for this interview. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, you too.